Roger, and to the front pages as we always do. Rishi Sunak's had a very, very big week, and the Sunday Telegraph splashes with his new plans. It says for Brexit, tax cuts to save the economy, and also uh, free ports all around Britain. The government's focus seems to be switching a bit from coronavirus to how to prepare for the end of the trade talks and Brexit, and we'll be talking about that a lot in this programme. Um, but if you're interested in taxes, there's a slightly different story on the front page of The Observer here. Um, this is former minister, Mr Gork, suggesting that to pay for the, co the huge cost of the borrowing that Rishi Sunak's brought in, we're going to have to have tax rises and or spending cuts. So are taxes going up? Are taxes going down? Again, something we'll talk about a lot. Sunday Times there, Jack Charlton um, from Ashington is on almost every single front page. Of course, the great member of the winning England World Cup team and also the manager of Ireland in 1990 when they got into the last eight. We'll talk about him a little bit as well. Their main story is they've been going very, very hard on the Leicestershire uh, clothing manufacturers, what they call the sweatshops. That's been a, a, an investigation that's been running for several weeks now in the Sunday Times. Interesting again this morning. Sunday Express there, they're going for my main guest this morning, uh, Michael Gove's coming in to talk about Britain's new borders. Britain takes back border control, it says. Michael Gove writing also elsewhere in the press. The Sunday Mirror there talking about the terrible Maddie story goes on. And the Mail on Sunday, finally, ministers fear China will blitz UK with a cyber 9-11. We're all aware that relations between the UK and China are deteriorating quite substantially at the moment. That is a story that's going to dominate, I would suspect, for weeks to come. Now, I'm joined, as I said, by Katie Balls of The Spectator and Chris Mason, the owner of the most famous haircut in Britain at the moment, because you had your haircut <laughs> on live television, Chris. Yes. Uh, that was my attempt to ensure that I got an appointment on the first day, so last Saturday. Well, it kind of worked. Uh, yeah, courtesy of the breakfast television planning desk, they managed to find me an appointment, so I thought it was only fair I'd take a camera in tow with me. Good man. Now, you're starting with the Sunday Express and the border story. Yeah, so our old friend Brexit has been on a siesta, hasn't it, from the front yeah. pages for the last six months or so. It is awaking from its slumber, front page in the Sunday Express, featuring, as you say, uh, Michael Gove, the... Uh, Cabinet Office Minister, who's going to be in this very chair in, uh, in half an hour or so. He's written a piece in the Sunday Telegraph, actually. And this is this whole idea about borders, about how our borders are managed after the end of this year. Of course, we're in this transition period, aren't we, where we've legally left the European Union, but in practical terms, everything's stayed the same, regardless of whether a deal is done between the UK and the EU in the next few months. Uh, the UK is leaving the customs union, leaving the single market, those hulking economic projects of the EU. And so new arrangements on the border are needed. And this is the border with France, the, the, the sea border, but it's also the border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland as well. That's the controversial, difficult bit. Yeah, so the focus from Michael Gove this morning is on the, the GB, the Great Britain border with the EU, i.e. not including uh, Northern Ireland, because, as you say, right at the heart of so many of the rows last year, and no doubt some of the discussions still mm. to come in the next six months, is the whole business of how the border is managed between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and then, crucially, between Northern yeah. Ireland and the Republic. Now, we know that Boris Johnson is getting very tetchy about leaks from the centre of government, and on cue, Liz Truss, the Trade Secretary, has written a letter to Michael Gove and Rishi Sunak complaining or worried about aspects of this new border, and it's been leaked. Yes, this letter was leaked to Business Insider uh, the, uh, the other day, uh, sent, as you say, uh, by Liz Truss uh, to the Chancellor and, and indeed to uh, Mr Gove. And the Mail on Sunday has a fantastic set of quotes this morning writing up this leak. One Dominic Cummings is clearly not shy about ending up in the newspapers, having found himself all over them. He's uh, not a couple chastened, of months ago. is he? He doesn't appear entirely <laughs> chastened. I'm not sure that word and him regularly occupy the same, uh, the same, uh, the same sentence. Anyway, it turns out Liz Truss was called into number 10 for what the Mail on Sunday don't quite call a ticking off. Their language is a little stronger for the exchange without coffee that perhaps went on between Liz Truss and uh, Dominic Cummings. Uh, the paper suggesting that uh, Dominic Cummings did buy the idea that Liz Truss hadn't leaked this herself, mm. but perhaps suggested it wasn't a good idea to write it down. Perfect. Don't write anything down in Whitehall that you don't want to see in public. There's a lovely quote as well here in which Mr Cummings apparently said to special advisers at their meeting on Friday night uh, that um, there shouldn't be any leaking because the snakes and reptiles of the media are crawling all over 
this government. So I don't know if that makes so me a snake and you a reptile, I or if I Katie is an amphibian we're, we're of some sort. We're all sort, snakes and reptiles and amphibians. That was a quote originally from Trotsky I read elsewhere, Katie. Uh, you've chosen a story from the front of the Sunday Telegraph, which is a change in advice, because we were told not that long ago, if possible, use your car. Now ministers are having second thoughts. Yes, so the government may want to talk about Brexit, but coronavirus has not gone away. And what we saw on Friday was a shift in the tone from the government on people going back to work. Boris Johnson is suggesting that if you can go back to work, you should. But the big problem here is lots of people need public transport to do that. So how do you, you, know, you get that all connected? Now, the suggestion in the Telegraph is conversations are ongoing as to how to do the messaging on this. And I just think it points to that difficult balancing act which is ultimately they do need people to be able to use public transport, but they don't want to do some big, you know, it's now fine and have, you know, rushes of people trying to go forward. Um, and I mean, we're already hearing other ways they're going to try and make people more comfortable. So face masks being one of them. Um, but ultimately, I think there has been a realisation in recent weeks in government that unless you can get people back to offices, a large parts of the economy are not going to not get yet. back to normal and city centres we're going to see lots of redundancies. And we've already seen that in those chains that serve office workers. So I think this public transport advice under discussion feeds into that. And public transport is really difficult because, I mean, I took a train to and from Scotland recently, and I was almost the only person on the train. And you think, for how long can they carry on running trains without passengers? And then you pass these buses going up and down, and very few people are sitting on them, and there's big signs at the front saying bus full, with only maybe six people inside the bus. How we move from that to a proper public transport system is really difficult. Yeah, exactly. I think the idea of keeping very regular services at a price most people can afford is really difficult if we keep on this route. So it's actually one of the biggest headaches. And I think it is pretty key to the whole government's strategy of getting the economy back. Um, you had a, a cabinet minister last week say, you know, well, actually, outside of London, lots of people drive. But I think city centres across the UK, you see people d depend on that. So it's not something you mm. can just brush off as a London no. centric. It's a, it's a really big problem. Katie, thank you for that. Um, Chris, um, I mentioned at the beginning the tax issue. Mm. David Gork on the front page of The Observer saying, actually, um, people with the broader shoulders, as Labour would put it, are going to have to pay more taxes, and that may well be the truth. Yeah, lyrical waxing about taxing from David Gork, who spent seven years as a Treasury Minister under David Cameron and then under Theresa May. Had a bit of a falling out, didn't he, with, with Boris Johnson over mm. Brexit and ended up running against a Conservative candidate in what was his... Uh, constituency. He's not particularly complimentary about Boris Johnson in an article he's written I in The Observer uh, saying that uh, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has outshone uh, the Prime Minister. But yeah, he says uh, in his article, Mr Gork, that for the first time since the early 60s, the size of government debt is going to exceed the size uh, of the UK economy. Tax increases will have to do most of the heavy lifting, mm. and he, he says. And he says it's not yet clear that the Conservative Party as a whole is reconciled to the reality that yeah. sound public finances will require higher taxes. So he's making the case and that pretty soon, Mr Sunat's going to have to say yeah. how we're going to pay for this. And even if he's not a fan of Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson himself has also said that, that we're not going to go back to austerity. The people who suffered after austerity um, at the bottom of the heap are not going to be made to do that again. And if that's true, then it has to be tax rises. Yeah, because the kind of colossal borrowing on the never-never can't mm. carry on forever. Plenty are arguing at Westminster at the moment that it's sustainable yeah. for now because interest rates are yeah. very low. But at some stage, as you say, it has to be paid back. And if you're not going to cut spending, then tax rises is the, is the, the obvious yeah. solution, I suppose. All right, Katie, um, let's turn to the opposition. Again, you've taken an observer story. Uh, Keir Starmer is polling very well, 100 days into his leadership. Just tell us a bit about that. Yes, yeah, so tomorrow marks Keir Starmer's first 100 days, and this poll uh, in The Observer is pretty good news for the Labour leader. It suggests that 50% of the public has had their opinion moved positively in favour of the Labour leader in that time. And on issues like competence, he seems to out, you know, rank the Prime Minister. We heard a few weeks ago a uh, poll that suggested, uh, quite rare for a Labour leader of late, that he leads on the question of who would make the best Prime Minister, at least in one poll. Um, but I think where uh, you can see a potential problem for Labour, or an opportunity, depending how you look at it, is although this headline saying, you know, on all counts, Keir Starmer is ahead. On economic competence, the Tories still lead 42% to 26%. And I think it touches on what Chris is saying to a degree, which is 
at the moment, the Tories do lead quite strongly on the economy, but lots of difficult decisions, an incredibly mm. unique circumstance in terms of the record borrowing we've had. So if uh, the Chancellor has made some miscalculations, things don't go quite to plan, it could potentially be Keir Starmer's opportunity. It's quite frustrating for all of us in journalism, but watch and wait and keep your mouth shut for the most part seems to be working quite well for Labour. Yes, I think lots of people thought Keir Starmer was a bit boring, to be quite frank, in that Labour leadership contest. But actually, I think uh, it was almost a quiet revolution we've seen from Keir Starmer since taking a leadership of the party. Um, I don't think he is seen to be the most exciting politician, but there is a sense that actually they just need to make sure he looks competent and then wait for the Tories to make mistakes. Ridiculously, we're already nearly out of time, Katie, but there's a story you've picked up in The Sun, which is quite fun. There is a conflict or a contradiction between two government policies. Explain more. Yeah, so this is Rishi Sunak's Eat Out to Help Out scheme, and it's been pointed out that offering potentially half price Big Macs at the same time we're expecting Downing Street to embark on a get fit campaign for the country <laughs> might not make the most sense on the surface. Um, but I think there's two things worth flagging. They're saying potential tensions, but it's worth noting that the story also says Downing Street was pushing to make this uh, eating out offer targeted at poorer households. Um, and also, I think that. The Prime Minister has changed his opinion on health and intervention um, ever since the own hospital spell. He thinks it's important mm. tackling coronavirus. But I still think that things like uh, you know, sin taxes, um, they're not his first port of call. I think no. he'll look to exercise and the role that health service can play. Absolutely. Um, the personal is always political. Chris, very, very quickly, mm. Huawei is the other story we haven't talked about. Yeah. This is going to be really big, I think, coming forward. A lot of Tories, particularly on the right of the party, feel we need a big reset in our relations with China. Yeah, so Tim Shipman, the Prince of Political Correspondence, has a piece in the Sunday Times uh, about this, the latest twist. It looks pretty much inevitable now, doesn't it, that the government yeah. is going to pull back uh, from uh, Huawei having a role well, in the, the 5G uh, well, network. And Huawei, it would appear in Tim's piece here, suggesting that they're saying, can you put it off until after the next election? And who knows, a more favourable government might come along. Chris and Katie, thanks both very much indeed. The story of